have to find my brother. These words from the end of Resident Evil 2 echoed in my young mind after finishing the game. For years, I wondered where Claire's adventures to find Chris would bring her. How would their reunion go? Was Chris in danger with Umbrella? I wouldn't have to wait long to have my questions answered because on March 28th, the year 2000, Resident Evil Code Veronica was released, answering my questions but leaving me with even more. To my surprise, Code Veronica would be the most important Resident Evil game narratively at the time, and I would argue that still stands true today. It would even bring back the series' most famous villain, Wesker, who at the time had been long dead since the first game, as well as expanding on the history of the monster creating virus. And, as your resident lore nerd, I love this. The game also introduced two of the greatest meme material characters in survival horror history. Steve, Father! Burnside, and Alfred, <laughs> Ashford. With how many important things Code Veronica does, it was shocking to see that it wasn't even a numbered title. And, even more so, when I talked to my friends about it, they would refer to it as... Oh yeah, that side game. Even Capcom has recently been treating Code Veronica like it doesn't exist, with Resident Evil 2, 3, and 4 all receiving remakes. CV is just kind of forgotten about, even though it's a major part of the story that takes place between the events of 3 and 4. So let's take it from the top, starting from the development of the game to the actual game itself, and its possible problems, so we can find out what happened to Resident Evil Code Veronica and why Capcom refuses to acknowledge it. Code Veronica follows up from Claire's ending line from Resident Evil 2, making it a direct sequel to the game. But what if I told you this almost didn't even happen, and Claire wasn't even going to be the protagonist of Code Veronica? To properly explain, we have to talk about Resident Evil 2 post-release. Man, everything goes back to RE2, huh? With the overwhelming success of Resident Evil 2 on the PlayStation, Capcom would of course want to capitalize on it by spreading it to the other platforms by creating ports. I already talked about the Nintendo 64 port of RE2 over in this video, so go and watch that after this if you want more information on how Capcom managed to create that impossible port. You have to hand it to Capcom for their devotion to making sure every console owner had the opportunity to experience Resident Evil. Capcom would look to the Sega Saturn, which already had a port of Resident Evil 1. Naturally, with the release of Resident Evil 2, another Saturn port was due. Unfortunately, this time around, due to graphics being sharper and more detailed, the Sega Saturn was simply not powerful enough to run a version of Resident Evil 2 that would meet Capcom's standards, ultimately leading to the cancellation of the port. This wouldn't be the end for Sega and Capcom's partnership though, because in May of 1998, Sega revealed their next console, the Dreamcast. Yoshiki Okamoto, who was also responsible for putting Resident Evil Zero on a Nintendo console, saw this as a chance to develop a game for the Dreamcast, which at the time would be the strongest home console to come out, allowing them to create a Resident Evil game on a grander scale. This would also make up for fans of the Sega Saturn not receiving Resident Evil 2. Nobura Sugimura, who wrote the story for Resident Evil 2, was also put in charge of Code Veronica's story, and initially intended for the story to star Jill Valentine. But because of Hideki Kamiya changing Claire's iconic line at the end of Resident Evil 2, the I had to find my brother line, without the permission of Sugimura, the story was changed to feature Claire instead as to not leave fans with a cliffhanger that wouldn't be answered. So can we all take a moment to thank Kamiya because the Code Veronica that we know today wouldn't exist without him, bending the rules just a little bit. Thank you Kamiya. The release of the game was met with critical success regarding it as one of the best Dreamcast games of all time, and at the time, the best Resident Evil game. This was a huge win, but there was a problem. Not that many people owned a Dreamcast at the time, and according to the sales numbers back then, there were only 1.2 million Dreamcasts in Japan compared to the PlayStation's 16 million. Code Veronica was sent out to die sales-wise, and the fact that this title wouldn't be receiving a number makes it less appealing to the average fan who would have had the entire Resident Evil collection so far available on the PS1. So why buy a brand new console for what seems to be a side game? This wouldn't even be the killing blow to Code Veronica. In an unbelievable turn of events on January 31st, 2001, Sega decided to bow out of the console business and stop the production of the Dreamcast. 
killing any chance of there being a future Code Veronica owners on Dreamcast. In August of the same year, an expanded version of the title would be released on the PlayStation 2 called Code Veronica X, which added expanded scenes with Wesker, and while this meant PS2 owners could finally experience the game, it would be lost amid the myriad of Resident Evil games coming out in the early 2000s. So with the development and the commercial factors out of the way, what about the game itself? Code Veronica is often coined as one of the hardest RE titles, with clearly frustrating design choices and it being kind of easy to lock yourself out of progress, possibly gatekeeping players from this more important game that stands as the link between classic Resident Evil and modern Resident Evil. The game starts off with Claire escaping an umbrella facility while searching for Chris. We treated to this amazing cutscene straight out of Mission Impossible and right off the bat, it's clear that Claire has transformed into a one-woman army. I wish I could play the whole scene. Actually, you know what? It's my video. I will. Her name is Claire Redfield. We caught her trespassing in our Paris lab facility 10 days ago. She apparently infiltrated the complex looking for her lost brother, Chris Redfield, one of the surviving members of RPD's famous STARS teams. Unfortunately, she's captured and brought to a nearby island base. Shortly after her arrival, the base is attacked by an unknown force, unfortunately spreading the T-virus all over the island, but fortunately allowing Claire to escape the prison. Once again, Claire's been thrust into the world of survival horror. Along the way, she'll run into Steve, a fellow prisoner, and many people's first issue with the game, even though he's not really an issue. Sure, Steve can be annoying at times and has a pretty interesting voice. Wait, wait, don't shoot! It's not classic Resident Evil if at least one person doesn't sound a bit off though. As for his personality, the game never makes it overtly obvious, but Steve is only 17 years old, taken prisoner in an unfamiliar place and could possibly be the only person in his family left alone in a world where a character with this kind of backstory would have a dark, brooding, untrusting personality. Steve chose to do the exact opposite by putting on an overly confident persona, and he's memorable for that exact reason. He's like a kid that's watched too many action movies with dashing lead characters that stare danger in the face while throwing out one-liners. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Now that he's in a situation similar to that, that's where he draws from. Steve's a dork, and that's okay. Now while you're navigating the island, there's a section very early that you'll come to with a metal detector requiring you to deposit metallic items in security bins in order to explore it. And there's two problems with this. The first one being the BOW gas rounds that are in the area. These are incredibly useful for a major boss fight down the road. And the game gives no indication of this. There are only three rounds and these are the only ones in the entire game. You can't actually take these with you though. The metal detector works both ways, so you'll deposit them and be on your way. 
You'll have an opportunity to come back to this area later though through a back door that will allow you to grab these rounds. But it's not mandatory and you might even forget about them. If you do remember to pick them up when given the opportunity, there's nothing stopping you from unknowingly using them on regular enemies. After all, there's an exception that you'll find more just like with the other ammo types in the game, right? Now, the other issue involving this area is of the same vein. Early on, you'll come here with an empty fire extinguisher that was previously used for a puzzle. And just like before, because it's metallic, you'll have to put it in the security box. Now, by this point, your inventory will be full or very close to full. And so far, there are no regular item boxes for you to unload items into. So you're faced with the choice, leave the empty fire extinguisher in the security box, freeing up a much needed slot and removing an item that you've already used, or take it with you in hopes that you'll find an item box later. If you go with the former, thinking that you'll no longer need it, I've got some terrible news for you. This empty fire extinguisher is directly linked to getting the magnum near the end of the game. Yup, this item that you've already used is needed for getting the strongest weapon in the game. Inherently, this isn't a bad thing, but just like with the BLW rounds, there's no indication. You're just supposed to know. In a possible remake, these issues could be negated with a simple file telling you about the BLW rounds. Or better yet, the removal of the metal detector as it's used for a single puzzle and immediately after becomes a hindrance. After a bit more exploring, the pair will run into the island base's commander, Alfred Ashford. Alfred's grandfather, Edward Ashford, was one of Umbrella's founding members, making the family of great importance. Alfred places blame on Claire for the island being attacked and decides that she must be punished for this. I have no idea what you're babbling about. You don't fool me. I am Alfred Ashford, commander of this base. Oh? You must be one of Umbrella's lower level officers if you're in command of a backwater base like this one. How dare you! The Ashford family is among the world's first and finest. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella Inc. Just watching that clip, you can see that Alfred is more animated and eccentric compared to past villains such as William and Annette Birkin from Resident Evil 2 or the single-minded hunter that was the nemesis from Resident Evil 3. It's important to mention that Claire and Steve will run into Alfred multiple times who on occasion will be dressed up as his sister Alexia due to the overwhelming loneliness from being the only known survivor of the Ashford family. Now. This is where the game really opens up and reveals to us another smaller issue. In some rooms and some areas, the enemies will respawn after you've killed them. Now typically in Resident Evil games, you have the choice to either kill the enemies in the room, making it safer to navigate, or try your hand at avoiding them and saving ammo. Respawning enemies throw a wrench in this formula. You can't really know which rooms have respawning enemies until, well, you've killed them and come back to see them alive again. If you're still coming to grips with the game, wandering around not really sure where to go or what's needed to solve puzzles, rooms with responding enemies will have you wasting your ammo if you decide to take them out every single time. In my most recent playthrough, there's a specific moment where I felt punished because of responding enemies. A decent way into Claire's section, you'll start to encounter the Bandersnatches, mutants with a large stretchy arm. There's a corridor that I had been traversing multiple times. Up until that point, I had resorted to just dodging them, hoping to not take damage each time I came through here. At a certain point though, I decided that enough was enough and just killed them. Bandersnatches are very annoying and can do things like this. So with this in mind, I felt like the trade-off for killing them was worth it. I'd be safe until I came back to this area. To my surprise, there they were again. And mind you, these aren't just the average zombies. They're a fair bit tankier. I really just had wasted my ammo. Now, after having multiple run-ins with Claire, Alfred, while dressed as Alexia, finally corners Claire, determined to finish her off. He's interrupted by Steve, and this is when our heroes learn that Alfred was playing the role of Alexia. Before this revelation, they were clueless to this fact. 
Angered by this, Alfred sets the base to self-destruct, and in typical Resident Evil fashion, we have to hightail it out with the use of a cargo plane that Claire discovered earlier. On the way to the plane, our path is blocked by a tyrant boss fight on a bridge. Kinda. It won't attack unless we get close to it, and we can't really run past it. The only choice is to unload on the boss until it goes down. After this, the pair finally make it to the plane and can take off, only to be forced into another boss fight. We've now reached the first major point of contention, the plane tyrant. Typing in the phrase, Code Veronica Plane Tyrant Boss Fight provides us with a myriad of old threads and forum posts of players desperately asking for help regarding this fight. Many of these posts describing getting to this boss fight with little to no ammo or healing. But why exactly is that? The respawning enemies. Code Veronica has a lot of enemies and a lot of backtracking on your first playthrough, leading to a lot of wasted ammo when dealing with the respawns. The boss fight before this is deceptive as well. The timer is counting down during a self-destruct sequence. If you didn't know any better, you might think the game is about to end. What's the harm in playing a little recklessly with your ammo? Using your heavy hitting ammo on the bridge boss fight. And then finding out that you must contend with the tyrant once again in a smaller space. And this time, he fights back. Now remember those BOW rounds that I mentioned earlier? Now is the time to use them. Nowhere in the game is it explicitly said what these do, but... I'm going to tell you, the gas rounds have the health of whatever you shoot at, making these rounds the most valuable thing in the game, next to the magnum, and essentially useless on anything that's not a boss. Just to drive my point home, here's a side by side of the boss fight with and without the gas rounds. This is barely a boss fight with the gas rounds, and it's sad to see potentially so many people having to restart their game when getting to this fight, simply because there's no in-game information about the BOW rounds, which is a recurring problem with Code Veronica, unfortunately. After defeating the boss, the game shifts to a new environment, with the most infuriating hallway to ever exist in a Resident Evil game. In this hallway are these moths that don't really do any damage, Instead, they can easily poison you. Now, Capcom wouldn't hang you out to dry here. There's a patch of blue herbs in the hallway that you can use to cure the poison status. Where the real issue starts to arrive is when you've been poisoned, your health automatically drops to caution, costing you a healing item if you want to go back to full. More so, if you kill these moths, they will respawn every single time. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that in this hallway is the door to the safe room. Every single time you want to go deposit or grab something from the item box, the moths will be there, just waiting for an opportunity to waste your ammo or to poison you. Either way, you lose, and it's such an interesting design choice with the sole purpose of frustrating a first time player. Now would be a good time to talk about Code Veronica's enemy variety. CV has the most varied cast of enemies of all the classic games featuring spiders, giant worms, bats, and the albinoid, which only appears in this game. With the recent remakes going for a more photorealistic style, 
making enemies like these appear realistic and properly functional in game would prove difficult, but you don't have to take my word for it. In an interview about the Resident Evil 2 remake, when asked what the most difficult part of remaking the game was, producers Tsuyoshi Honda and Yoshiaki Hirabayashi had this to say. 20 years ago, the graphics that we had weren't photoreal and that meant you could get away with a lot of things. Things that maybe you couldn't today. You could be fantastical with the creatures and it wouldn't stand out too much. So making a giant alligator, that's a real challenge. Trying to update that into a game where you've got scanned faces, motion captured actors, photorealistic environments, it's really, really hard. Where do you even start? To make that convincing in any way was really tough. For a while, we were just thinking, shall we just cut the alligator altogether? It's too difficult, but we knew there'd be a fan backlash. We knew that we had to create one of these perfect fan favorite moments. So it's a tough one, but it's there. It was tricky to do without changing the game's tone a lot. We're competing with people's memories with this game too, and that's really hard. Trying to make a convincing scene where a human-sized character, a guy with a knife, is taking on an alligator, that's really silly. People don't remember it as silly because the whole game was groundbreaking at the time, but that moment was ridiculous. It was a difficult process for us making that work today. Now understanding their thought process, it's easy to see why Code Veronica would be the most challenging game to remake and why we haven't gotten one yet. And going back to the story, after dealing with the moths and finding your way around the Arctic facility, Steve and Claire run into Alfred one last time before his demise and are finally ready to make their escape. The game makes it abundantly clear that a boss fight will be coming up. Most likely, you'll head back to the box, past the moths, to grab healing and big weapons. You know, your typical boss fight prep stuff. The game also provides a sniper rifle for the fight as well, which will make all of your other weapons mute. The boss goes down in four sniper shots to the chest. Yep, that's it. I hope you didn't bring too many big weapons because right after the boss, the switch to playing as Chris happens. Alfred manages to wake up the real Alexia before his death, as she's been cryogenically in stasis for the past 15 years, merging with a virus. Upon awakening, she uses her newfound power to capture Claire and Steve. Now, you get to play as Chris, Claire's brother who comes equipped with a pistol. But that's okay. Chris and Claire share the same item box, so you can just pull your weapons out of O. Oh, if Claire was carrying most of the weapons, you won't be seeing them again until the very final stretch of the game. People's playthrough of the Chris section can be wildly different due to this fact, and while Chris has access to some of the other weapons during this section, two of them are locked behind the fire extinguisher, and one of them is a secret based on if you did a certain task as Claire. Chris is only guaranteed one extra weapon during his playthrough, the shotgun. Fortunately, there is plenty of ammo for it. But the fact that most of your inventory depends on Claire, without the game even bothering to tell you, hey, there's a character switch coming up, make sure there's some things left in your box, is just a bit unfair to the player. Most of the problems in Chris's section come from this unannounced character switch. The section itself is fine, as it's just a retreading of some areas in the island, now destroyed as you navigate for a way off the island. The most notable thing that happens here is the revelation to Chris that Wesker is still alive. Up until this point in the series, Wesker has been dead and forgotten. Code Veronica brings him back, gives him superpowers, and sets him up to be a major villain in the future. As we've established, a lot of people have never played or beaten this game, so they miss this arc that sets up Chris and Wesker's hatred of each other. Once Chris finds a way off the island, we travel to the Arctic facility in pursuit of Claire. More exploring and you'll finally be reunited with Claire only to be immediately separated. Now we're back in charge of Claire. Another sudden switch and another issue. This is a very short section where you play as Claire, but the game doesn't tell you that. So thinking otherwise, you're probably going to stock up from your item box. In reality, all you need is a single weapon and at least two heals. There's mostly no fighting here. Instead, you'll be running from a mutated monster whose attacks are guaranteed to hit you at least twice. This is what the healing is for. If you don't have any healing, it's game over for your save file. And if you only have one save file, time to restart the entire game. There's a way to glitch into a safe spot to avoid damage, but if performing a glitch is the only way for you to proceed, I'm sorry to say, but that's probably a bad game design. 
Once you escape that monster, the game immediately switches back to Chris, throwing you into a boss fight against Alexia. The fight itself isn't too hard, and Capcom was kind enough to include a retry button if you die, because Alexia can one-shot you. Once you're done here, you've reached the end of the game. No more switching, just one more boss fight against Alexia. And I hope you didn't put too many of your weapons on Claire because you can't access those once you're back as Chris again. There aren't really any issues with this final boss fight. I'm just historically bad at landing the final hit. It always makes me crack up. I think it's fair to say that while Code Veronica is an amazing game, some of these issues make it hard for first time players to even finish the game. CV has this expectation that the player should already know what they're doing and on a first playthrough, the only way to find out this information is to follow a guide or talk to a friend who has already played the game, like we're doing right now. I can't blame new players for getting frustrated and quitting the game. Many of the mechanics actively work against and punish you without this prior knowledge. The commercial distribution of the game worked against it as well, with Capcom developing the game exclusively for the Dreamcast, which would unfortunately die a year later. Despite all these issues, Code Veronica warmed its way into my heart as one of my favorite Resident Evil titles and one of the most underappreciated titles in the series. Sure, it can be frustrating at times, but all the unforgettable moments more than make up for that. Any time that Alfred or Steve talk, the music, the atmosphere, and Claire and Chris reuniting, it's a story of siblings, albeit one of the pair is a bit odd, but that just serves to make them even more memorable than the usual human villains not named Wesker. And don't you think that it's odd that despite Claire and Chris both being adept at dispatching zombies and being related, this is the only canon game that they're both in. In a time of remakes, now's the perfect time for Capcom to retell the story of Code Veronica. This time, setting it up for success on consoles that won't suddenly be discontinued and fixing some of the more frustrating aspects of the game. With the team being more experienced now in designing enemies for photorealism and having three modern remakes under their belt, I really believe they could do Code Veronica justice in translating the various monster designs for a present day audience. Just like CV was the culmination of experience and ideas used in the original classic trilogy, a Code Veronica remake can and should be the pinnacle of the modern remake trilogy that we have received so far. Resident Evil Code Veronica deserves better from Capcom, and it's time they finally acknowledge it. Thank you for watching.